So um, my purpose is to provoke a uh, conversation about how the residential colleges and halls might, might be partners in making whole places, both um, in your own facilities, uh, on the campuses uh, where you're located, as part of the cities that uh, you're in, and the larger metros, because I think that um, problem of, of whole place making is really underneath this uh, towards a resilient future challenge of our time. And it is the problem we need to solve. Um, and it, in solving it, particularly if you're part of that, is how we're going to create the leaders to help us keep solving it. Um, in America, we have this expression, I think you have it here, of the town and the gown. So think of this as the, the, the town talking to this conclave of the gown about how you might help uh, the town reinvent itself and in so doing perhaps help you reinvent yourself. So um, just to clarify things because I know it's a little difficult with my American accent. We're talking about Stanford, Connecticut and not Stanford University. Stanford's in Palo Alto on the west coast and Stanford is a, is a satellite to New York City. Um, and this slide of the U.S. at night sort of illustrates something uh, that we have in common with Australia, which, which is that our, our population centers and our innovation and business centers are really located on the two coasts. Not quite as concentrated there as in Australia, but still, that's where the bulk of activity is. So there's three things you need to know about Stanford in terms of context. And the first is that it has a long history of reinventing itself. It's been very good, to use this now tired metaphor, of surfing the waves of economic change rather than just standing there, letting the wave crash over us and hoping that we'll be standing on the other side. So it started out uh, as a manufacturing center, actually called itself the Lock City. Believe it or not, locks were the high-tech product of the time. Um, and around World War II, a lot of research labs were uh, built in Stanford uh, in suburban campuses, you know, the Sylvan suburbs. Um, and the city actually changed its name to the City of Research. And then in the 70s, a lot of Fortune 500 headquarters companies moved out of New York, so Stanford became the number two uh, headquarters locations for uh, companies in the U.S. after New York. And then in the um, 90s, in a bit more of a deliberate strategy on the city's part, uh, we recruited uh, major investment banks, particularly foreign investment banks, who could build in Stanford these huge trading floors. We have the largest and the second largest um, column-free trading floor in the world. Um, UBS, the largest bank in the world, and RBS the, uh, was the largest bank in the UK have their North American headquarters not in New York but in Stanford. And a lot of um, hedge funds as that industry started to evolve um, started up in Stanford and Greenwich such that we really became known as Wall Street North. And uh, the current unpleasantness that we're all dealing with was in part brought to you by us. Um, and we've uh, paradoxically continued to grow even during the recession because our real estate's cheaper than New York and London. So it's been perversely a positive for us. Um, but we know that that industry will not grow in the future at the rate that it's grown in the past. And part of the impetus for this initiative was, was thinking we needed to um, find a new economic pillar uh, and reinvent ourselves once again in New York. And, and Stanford, to a large extent, reflects the New York economy. So all these changes have reflected changes in New York. And there are folks in New York who talk about what New York is as the city of fire and ice. And they're, they're, they're playing what is a wonk would think is a clever word game uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, the data codes that the federal government keeps. Fire is finance and insurance and real estate. And ice is something that New York made up, which is innovation, creativity, and entertainment. And Stanford is now in that space as well. So 
we are like New York, a city of fire and ice. And the, the important thing um, to know about this is that as each of these uh, new identities was emerged, it didn't replace the one before it, it layered over it. So Stanford's still a manufacturing center, but a very high tech one. It's still a research center, but it's focused on IT rather than chemicals and um, electronics. It's still a headquarters location, but the headquarters are now much smaller. Everything else is outsourced. And as I said, it's continuing to evolve as a, as a financial services center, even during this time of turmoil. And now it's taking on this more um, developed identity as a city of fire and ice. And it's always been more of a big company place, and we really think we need to emphasize the entrepreneurial sector much more than we have. Um, so it has been a resilient city, and I, and I would say if we were going to pick a position, that would be a position to pick, the, the resilient city, knowing that um, this, this history of, of episodic reinvention is now a necessity of ongoing, continuous reinvention. It, reinvention is us. That's what we have to do. And I think, you know, in um, any place that has high-cost land, high-cost labor, high taxes, um, lack of natural resources, not a particularly great location on the global logistics system, mediocre weather, um, it's really innovate or die. I mean, those are the choices that we have. And it, it's not just our choice. It's to a large extent, the choice of the whole uh, developed world. We may just be uh, at the head of the pack in having to address this. So the other thing to know is that we're a waterfront city. This is the uh, view of downtown and the harbor. Uh, we're on the Long Island Sound. We have a hurricane barrier. And we're one of only three cities in the East Coast that has one, but it was built for um, hurricanes that were predicted you know, 30 or 40 years ago. So it's probably not going to uh, stand us in the, the new uh, freak weather and storm surge that will accompany sea level rise as a result of climate change. Um, and in, you know, in that, we share uh, a condition with all of your cities. And uh, here we are at the shoulder of New York. This is a slide showing uh, population density in the Northeast. So, the top is Boston, you have the cities of Connecticut, the big spike is New York, then Philadelphia, and then down uh, on the far left is um, Baltimore and Washington. And when we talk about, well, these are population <coughs> density spikes, but they're proxies for uh, concentrations of innovation capability. There isn't actually a data source that would say, where is the innovation capability? But I, I think it would, if there was one, it would come out pretty similar to this. And when we talk about networking capability, we mean networking these capabilities of this whole mega region. And um, we actually, even though we're this city of 120,000 in this region of 40 million, you know, the intervening scales is we have a labor shed of 2 million, about the population of Western Australia that we're the hub of, and then we're part of, we're the major business satellite in the 20 million New York metro, and then we're part of this larger 40 million uh, Northeast mega region. Um, and because we would be so advantaged by economic geography going from the metro scale, which is where it is now, pretty much globally, um, to the mega regional scale, we would be particularly advantaged because we would go from being on the edge of the New York metro to being at the center of the mega region and, and have access to all of its capabilities. And so we've been very keen on um, advocacy and mobilizing our peers around federal and state investment in the rail infrastructure in terms of uh, more frequent more integrated, higher speed intercity, and particularly commuter rail that would aggregate the capabilities of this region. 